Well, hey there, American Farmsteadhurst. This is Jenny with the Gramstead Family Farm. And Donna with Hazel Bell Farm. And we are coming to y'all from Northeast Florida as two American Farmstead Hers doing our best to grow our own food and share our homesteading experiences with you in hopes that you'll grow a little food of your own. Yeah. This week we want to talk about why new gardeners fail at the garden, right? Yeah. Yeah. The top reasons why gardens fail. So what's the thing that people who don't garden say to you when you post pictures of your produce? It's always something (laughs) along the lines of, oh, I tried to grow a tomato plant once and it died and so I have a black thumb. Right, right. I could never do that because I have a black thumb. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) No. No, you don't. No, you don't. And we're going to talk about why that is and why you can grow food too. Absolutely. Okay, so let's go through the mistakes that they make and the reasons they fail. So they that first thing that you mentioned, they tried something one time. Right. It didn't work out. Right. They didn't take care of it <laughs> or they <laughs> overly loved it or <laughs> something like that. And it didn't thrive. They didn't have success. Um, and so they can't garden and they quit. Yeah. Right. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that people that people make with the gardening is that they're just not spending enough time out into the garden. Right. And not that the garden has to take a whole lot of time because I honestly feel like once it's set up, if it's mm-hmm. set up in a good way, mm-hmm. it doesn't take a ton of time. Yeah, and like and this is big gardener people telling you, like we have large gardens, large growing spaces saying this, like we have a big push, like where there's a busy season. Yes. But like right now, everything's in. Yeah. And there's kind of really nothing to do. Right. I mean, at this point, now that everything's in, I might be side dressing some stuff with compost. Right. I mean, I'm still walking through checking. Walking through checking, looking for bugs, which I have already found worms on my tomato plants. Mm -hmm. I have some bugs. And watering. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can cut down on a lot of your watering if you have mulched your garden or Mm -hmm. done some type of cover for your soil. I Mm -hmm. mean, that is a huge time saver. Or put up some kind of like timer on your sprinkler or whatever. Yeah, you can definitely save some time there. Um, So, yeah, not making your garden the priority is, I think, the biggest problem people have. Right. Like if you really have the desire to grow food and grow a garden Mm -hmm. and that desire is really there, Mm -hmm. you will be successful. Yeah. And let me just give a quick example of where I've seen this as a a true statement in my own garden. So Uh like, especially like in the early years. So my first garden, I I didn't know what I was doing, Um, but I did make it my priority. Right. And I've told the story before where I bought broccoli to grow in summer. And that's just not something that you do here where we are in 9A. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So I didn't know better. And um, I still didn't know even like the following year. So I I bought broccoli. Um, I somehow lucked out. Like I had beginner's luck. Right. And I think this is like something funny too, that everybody seems to have some kind of beginner's luck with something in their garden. And I think that keeps us going, which is great. Um, but then, so then the second year, I tried to do broccoli again in the summer, and it didn't go well. I had actually moved the garden, and I think that was the saving grace for that first year. Yeah. But, like, I I don't know. I, I've done this over and over again where I'm like, okay, now I want to grow this. And I don't, like, Roselle, I don't know anything about it. I research it to death, and I have that first year success because it was the priority, right? right? I knew how to feed it. I right. knew what it, I, how much light it needed. I knew the soil kind. You know, I knew all the things. I totally babied those roselle plants and had an amazing first year harvest. Yeah. The second year, I got cocky, right? Uh-huh. Oh, I can, I can do this. <laughs> I got, I got this. this. And it wasn't my priority. Like something else was my priority. Right. And I got almost no roselle. Yeah. So, like, I've seen that over and over again. With just myself, yeah, and 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 in other gardeners as well. So, like, make it your priority. Yeah, make it the priority, mm-hmm. uh, and do your research on what grows mm-hmm. at a certain time of year. Because honestly, like, I mean, I stopped by um, across the street from our feed mill. There's the Ace Hardware mm-hmm. that always has like nice plants and stuff like that. So I always stop in through there whenever I go to get feed and. When I was there, you know, I was looking for stuff for the spring and summer garden, but mm-hmm. yet their their shelves were still full of cabbage, right. collards, 
it, it was <laughs> it was all the stuff right it was all the stuff that was left over that they didn't sell for people for their winter gardens mm-hmm. and that stuff was still on the shelves mm-hmm. so an unsuspecting new gardener mm-hmm. would go in there and go oh i can grow collards in right. the summer well no not so much not so much right it's, you might struggle with that winter is going to be much better yeah yeah i agree and even if you if you do it's not going to taste as good yeah no they're going to be bitter <laughs> yeah it's not going to be good yeah Yeah. So, and I mean, that's kind of tough when you're a new gardener, like you don't know, maybe none of your friends are gardening. So, you know, you really need to find, like, I mean, there's a lot of good groups online. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I know on Facebook, I'm part of a a vegetable gardening group that is specific to my zone. Right. You know, so there's lots of ways to get the information. You just got to make sure you're getting it. Yeah, that's something that bothers me about the big box stores, especially. Yeah, and the way they you sell, see it a lot. Yeah, plants or like um, onions. So right now you're seeing a lot of onion sets out for sale. Right. It is not the time of year to do that here. No, I put my onions in in November. Right, right, <laughs> right. We grow them over winter. So, but again, unsuspecting new gardeners, they wouldn't know that. You wouldn't naturally know that. So yeah, yeah. and that was me. With right, the broccoli. with your broccoli. <laughs> right, again, beginners like that. I think what happened was, the, and I was actually just considering, like, remember that first year garden when you grew all that broccoli? How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I was a busy, young, working mama, mm-hmm. and um, I often <laughs> turned the sprinkler on and forgot about it. So I think they got like extra water, and right? The the where the garden was placed, it got like maybe three hours of sun a day because I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it was all cow pen dirt. Right. So like it had, it was super nutrient dense. (laughs) It got a lot of water and a lot of shade for a summer garden. Yeah. I think that's what what brought me broccoli in summer. So if you want to do that, then there you go. That's the formula apparently. (laughs) But the next year, again, I think we moved the garden and I think um, I just didn't pay attention to it. It just wasn't the thing I was excited about. I think I was probably into tomatoes or something else. Right. Right. Yeah. So another thing um, that we talk about, you know, besides that I killed it once, um, not in, I guess maybe this goes into priorities also, but if you're not spending any time around your plants, you don't see disease or right. pest pressure. You yeah. Know? Like I might think there's nothing, oh, there's nothing to do. There's nothing going on. And so I don't go out there. Right. But what do they say? The garden's best friend is the gardener's shadow. Right. Yeah. And it's true. But I mean, you know, you can just about be out there walking around. And mm-hmm. I mean, once you start to learn to look what, know what you're looking for as right. far as like, Pest pressure. Squash bug eggs. Yes. Or um, a little hole in one vine on a cucumber plant. It could right. mean no cucumber plant tomorrow. <laughs> right. Or those bottom leaves on your tomato plants. Hmm. They have a couple of brown spots on them. Mm-hmm. Well, you better get those trimmed off. <laughs> right. I need to do that, actually. Yeah. 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 So um, I did not trellis my tomatoes. I did the um, y'all do as I say, not as I do thing. Like (laughs) how many times you say like, if you're going to plant something that needs to be trellised, have your infrastructure in place first. Right. I did not because I needed help with that. So I did the part I could do, which was plant the tomatoes. Right. Um, So they got a little floppy on the ground and I've got some bacterial wilt on those leaves. Yeah, I have to get them trimmed up now that they have trellis. So that would be another thing that I would caution you against is um, not trellising what needs to be trellised. Yeah, know what you're growing, you know, Mm -hmm. because certain plants are going to like a trellis and certain plants don't need a trellis. You know, and it's not only tomatoes, like if you think about your beans, Mm -hmm. you know, you've got those beans that like to climb and then you have bush beans. So there's different varieties of things. So know what you're growing. Or even like certain plants just like a little extra support like peppers. Like some of your right. peppers can grow to be, you know, two and a half feet tall. Yeah. They Sometimes they like a little cage. Yeah, especially if you are in a thunderstorm prone area with lots of wind, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Um, they might like a little help with that. So Yeah. So while we're kind of on the subject on why some gardens fail, it would be... Pest and disease. Mm-hmm. Big time. 
big time. Yeah. I mean, I would say like the whole blight issue, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in hot, humid areas are probably one of the biggest reasons why people fail with tomatoes. Yeah. And honestly, like that's the thing that takes out our tomatoes every summer. Right. When they're done. Right. Like, I mean, just because we have a successful garden doesn't mean that we don't struggle with these issues. Like, I always have blight in my garden. Right. You know, because once it's there... It's you're essentially not, there. You're not getting rid of that, the organism from the soil. Right. I mean, in, unless you're sterilizing your soil, and that's not what we want. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's always going to be there. Um, you're always looking for it. You're always treating for it. Um, what are some, what do you do for blight? I really just stay on top of keeping my plants pruned. Mm -hmm. I am a heavy pruner when it comes to that. And as soon as I see a brown spot on a leaf, Mm -hmm. that stem's gone. Yeah. And don't keep those trimmings in your garden. Like, it's really tempting just to, like, throw them down on the ground. Mm -hmm. But those things (laughs) that have blight on them need to be taken out of the garden so the problem just doesn't continue to get worse. Yeah. Don't put them in your compost, especially. Um, They go right in the fire pit at my house. I was going to say, we burn them. Yeah. Yeah, they go in the fire pit. Yeah. Um, so besides blight, um, and I do too, I, I mean, that's to heavy prune is a, is a good way to prevent, to attempt to prevent. I mean, like we said, you're not going to prevent not right. here. Right. Not in a, in no, a, I mean, it's it just to be a hundred percent humidity, you know? Right. It's just a common problem. <clears throat> um, but heavy pruning is going to help, um, not only slow it down, but mm-hmm. just provide good airflow. You just want to make sure that you're not creating a situation with your plants where it's going to make something like blight thrive. Right. Additionally, starting with a good healthy soil. Yeah. Like f- making sure you're building up soil over time, feeding your soil, not your plants, is going to help you have a healthier plant that can fight off the blight. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. And then have your pest control measures on hand. Yes. Yes. Which I do not have BT, and I already found worms on my tomatoes. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. I started, so I did walk through my garden this morning for a brief minute to turn on the sprinkler and just check a few places. And so I did notice, so I've got some succession sowing going on with green beans. Uh And um, one box is about two weeks ahead of the second box. The second box is just now coming up out of the soil and I looked over at the first one. So they're like two weeks old. I'm like, oh, they're so cute. I love those little baby plants. Yeah. They've got their true leaves come in. Yeah. They're starting to, you know, get big. And um, this is when I usually, and I thought, this is when I usually see the little, um, are they army worms that, yeah. that come into green beans? Is that mm-hmm. what it is? And they like fold, they make a little cocoon on the leaves. Yes, right? they fold over part of the leaf. Right, and they they eat at them. They cut them and and fold them over and you end up having to squish a bunch of little baby caterpillars in your Sorry. fingers. It's gross. <laughs> um, but they will take out your crop, right? right? And so I, I realized as soon as I saw like all these, this great little stand of bean plants, I was like, oh, now's the time to start watching. So as soon as I see yeah. a couple, I will probably treat that yeah. um, with a BT. BT. Yeah. Yeah. And so while we're on the issue of like since succession sowing and new plants coming up, mm-hmm. um, I sowed my green bean seeds like super heavy this year because Me my, too. well, my seeds were kind of old. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to make sure that I had enough <laughs> come up and like they all came up <laughs> and, um, So, and I don't normally do that with my green beans because they're kind of like a tried and true, kind of easy thing to grow. Yeah. So I don't usually heavy seed them like that, but I did this year. And so what do you think the best age, because that's another reason why new gardens fail. Mm -hmm. You you plant too heavily, too densely, you sow too many seeds, Mm -hmm. you don't thin them. Too much competition. Too much competition. Right. And I think that when they're seedlings, I think that they almost benefit from a little bit of competition. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if, you know. I like to let them fight it out when they're young and and see who's going to be stronger. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think the best time is to thin something like a green bean? Oh, gosh. to thin. I I don't think I've ever thinned green beans because I I normally plant appropriately. (laughs) Mine are like one seedling every inch. Okay. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I, okay, so, so at that, so beans don't like their roots <laughs> to be disturbed. So I probably right. would do those pretty quickly. Yeah, and cut them. And cut them instead yeah. of pull them. Yeah. Right? 
So, and the thing, so it's funny that we're talking so much on green beans and that you say you need to thin them. Um, so when I started to get serious about gardening, I started, um, the Mel's Mel Bartholomew's square foot gardening. Yeah. Like I re- checked out the book from the library. I think like back to back time, I should have bought the book, but we were broke. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there was no buying of books, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, I checked it out a couple of times and, I love that intensively planting. You can feed feed plants anything and they'll grow. Um, I, that's what really got me hooked on the garden. And so I've kind of, my gardening method now is like a, a meld of different philosophies in gardening, right? right? And so like I can appreciate square foot. I can also appreciate no-till as much as I can appreciate tilling, right? you know? <laughs> um, so like I kind of do a combination of things. And I went back to that um, intensive planting for the beans. Mm-hmm. And now I'm looking at it going, I don't know. Like those are, it's, it's, so green beans in particular are supposed to be nine per square foot. That's a lot. That is a lot. But so I, I've done it successfully in the past, mm-hmm. like when I was new to it. Um, nowadays, I usually go like every six inches, which would bring, yeah. oh, I guess that is nine per square foot. Is it? Six Inches, one, two, three. Yeah, I guess it would be. Anyway, I get, but I don't think I do. That's just off the top of my head. Every six inches, I think I probably go more like eight inches, and grow nice big flush plants. But um, I, I mentioned before I got that seeding square. Yeah, for Christmas, and so green beans is one of the things that you know you, you want to direct sow those beans. And so I thought this is a chance to use it, and and yeah, it's marked out nine per square foot and so they, they've cut <laughs> up and I'm like oh, I saw your picture no. that's a bunch of green it's beans a bunch of green beans all together we'll see what happens yeah it'll be an experiment if nothing else and if I don't get good green beans I'll have to do it again in the fall right so I'm thankful we can do that right so well I mean you can always do that bed and then succession so you know a Something. couple of other times somewhere else and do it a different way here's, see how it comes out here's the problem my garden is full yeah. I still do you have still have a lot of winter stuff in there, don't you? You have cabbages. I do have a lot of and cabbages. Onions, yeah. And we got yeah. potatoes in, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which yeah, will be coming right. out sometime soon-ish. I feel like we take potatoes out in May. Yeah, May or June. That's usually when I like to go behind with like my zipper peas. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Okay, so yeah, you're right, not thinning. Um, That's especially true with things that uh, come recommended to heavy sow, like carrots. Carrots, yes. You've got to thin them carrots, Mm -hmm. or you are just not going to get carrots. Yeah. Um, I don't have so much trouble. Uh, So squash, and I talked about this a couple weeks ago, like squash and okra. When I direct sow any kind of those seeds, I plant two at a time. Right. Two to three, even. Right. And then, um, yeah, see which one's going to be stronger and clip the second and third. Yeah. Um, I don't pull them out. I clip them. Yeah. So the roots aren't disturbed. Um, I forget why I was saying that, (laughs) what the point (laughs) of that was. (laughs) But, yeah, that has to be done. Like, you can't forget to do it. If you do forget to do it, that's what it was. If you do forget to to thin those, even if it's just two plants or three plants, none of them are going to do well. Right. So – you want you want one of them to do well. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So another reason why gardens fail, weeds. Weeds. Oh, this is the bane of my existence in the garden. The weeds. I yeah, hate. the weeds in the grass. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes it. I mean, if you let it get ahead of you, mm-hmm. it's really hard to get it back that season. I mean, at the end of the season, you can always tarp it. Which right. my tarp is my best friend in my garden, yeah, because of the weeds and the grass. I'm convinced I need some heavier tarps for my grass. Yeah, my grass it it's just relentless. It's crazy. It is crazy. Which is why I bought a tiller because I was digging so deep to get the rhizomes out for the grasses we have in the garden that are spreading right. in there. I was like, I'm tilling by hand. Like right. I'm spending <laughs> hours and hours of back. Breaking, like literally my back hurt so bad after pulling grass out of the garden. I was like, this is stupid. I'm getting a tiller. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm already tilling. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's 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 my reason for appreciating the till garden. Yes. Yeah. If I could have gotten my tiller fixed, I totally would have tilled the perimeter of my garden 
I probably wouldn't have done my rows because in between my like in-ground rows, I've had pretty good success with keeping the weeds and the grass down in between my rows Mm -hmm. and in my actual beds. Mm -hmm. It's the perimeter and my large walkways that get out of control. Me too. So definitely the perimeter, definitely the perimeter. And last year when we put down mulch and we mulched the perimeter, it just made it mad. Like, you know, what got mad at me (sighs) with the mulch is the dollar weed. Yes. Like it went crazy. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to me last year. So this year, um, I wanted to mulch the garden again, but I remembered how bad that got around the perimeter. So the perimeter now gets mowed or weed whacked, and then I only mulched in between my rows. Mm-hmm. But before I put all that mulch down, we had mulch in between the rows from last year that has already been there essentially for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's had a little bit more time to break down. So before I put my new mulch down, I raked all my old mulch up into my beds mm-hmm. You know, because it's a little more decomposed. The pieces are a little bit smaller. And I was really starting to see a lot of soil on my beds. So you want to get that covered. So I raked up all the old stuff in the beds and then remulched my walkways. And then I'm just going to stay on top the rest of it with the weed whacker. Yeah. I I took the lawnmower to the perimeter of mine this weekend. And um it looks so much better. I know. <laughs> Doesn't like, it look so much better like when you do not, the work? Yeah, it's not overwhelming now. Like it it's it's like the rock going downhill or the snowball going downhill, the rock. Right. <laughs> it picks up more rocks. There's <laughs> no, like the snowball going downhill and um you know, I just it's motivating to to keep going and do something more. Yes. I mean, you see it and you're like, "Oh, there's hope." Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, weeds and grass is definitely one of the reasons why a lot of new gardeners fail, or Mm -hmm. gardens just in general. doesn't Mm -hmm. even have to be a new gardener. Mm -hmm. Um, Gardens in general. I'm not a new gardener, and I'm fighting it, man. (laughs) Fighting it every year. All the time. So, you know, things like that, things like, you know, looking for pests or pruning or weeding, put stuff like that on a schedule. Watering. You know, watering. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, I mean, right now I know that I, I am, I'm only having to water my tomato plants like once every like three or four days because mm-hmm. they are so heavily mulched. Um, you know, and so that's, it's all just on a schedule now. So pick a day mm-hmm. for every task. Or mm-hmm. I know at one point you were doing zones in your garden. I was. I, I'm not able to keep that up yeah. like I want to. I mean, in theory, it's great. On paper, it's great. But in real life, it's not. It doesn't work. Yeah. See, I do better with picking a task for a day. Mm-hmm. You know, Tuesday is bug day. Wednesday right. is pull weeds. You know, right. and you don't have to commit a whole lot of time to it. You know, if you can go out there for 30 minutes mm-hmm. and just put a little dent in it, like every little bit helps. Get yourself a scuffle hoe or a, yes. it's also called a stirrup hoe or a hula hoe. Um, so I, the other night I just went out there. It was like after dinner, before dark, mm-hmm. had a little bit of time, walked through the garden with my scuffle hoe in in about 20 minutes, I had all of my walkways yes. on the in-ground garden done, all of my beds done in the whole garden. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really, if you stay on top of it, you can do it in no time and, yeah. and not have to think that you're spending a whole day weeding a garden. Right. Yeah. And the scuffle hoe, I mean, you can put a major dent in your little tiny weeds, but you just got to, like you said, you got to mm-hmm. stay on top of it. You got to get them when they're small. Mm-hmm. And I have learned that the scuffle hoe works the best when it's really hot and really dry out. Mm-hmm. Like don't go out there and try to scuffle hoe after a rain because right. everything's just going to reroot unless you pick out every little thing. Yeah. But if you're running your scuffle hoe when your soil is really dry and hot, mm-hmm. those things aren't going to reroot. No. No, they dry out. Yep. So I mentioned the watering. You mentioned putting it on a schedule. So not just underwatering, but another problem we yes. see is Overwatering. Overwatering. <laughs> and I'm very guilty of overwatering peppers in particular. Are you? I am. Yeah. I'm and really. Then, and then they're not hot like you like. All right. I know. <laughs> and so I really, that's one thing that I'm really trying to focus on with my peppers this year is just stressing them a little bit and making sure they're dried out before they get watered again. Mm-hmm. So, um, because I honestly, I like to walk around and water the garden, yeah. especially with my new watering wand. 
<laughs> I just love it. There's nothing like a new toy to make you want to work, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's just nice being out in the garden. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know. I, I like to just be out there to water. Yeah. Which is why still we haven't done any kind of like permanent irrigation system because yeah. I like to water. Yeah. I mean, I did the permanent irrigation for about three years and I found that my bug problem was a lot worse with the permanent irrigation because I wasn't in the garden as much. Mm-hmm. I would just walk up to the spigot and turn it on mm-hmm. and then I would go back inside. Right. Hmm. So, you know, you miss a lot when you do those convenience type things, right. but those convenient things are really convenient sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll tell you, I have a sprinkler on my garden right now while we're talking because right. I don't have the time to be out there today and it, stuff has to get watered today. Right. Or it's it's going to die. So Yeah. That's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. It's the way it is sometimes. So, yep. you know, I think that it has its pros and its cons. Yep. How about fertilizing or keeping a healthy soil, not feeding the soil? Not feeding the plants, not feeding the soil. They go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. And I really feel like if somebody really wants to be serious about gardening, you got to have a good source of compost Mm -hmm. or learn to make your own and make it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Because having compost that's ready to go where you can just walk around and side dress stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. you can add that to the day that you walk around and check everything for bugs. Right. Give everybody a handful of compost. Right. Yeah, that's a good good point. Um, Even if you can't make it and you, this this is fine if you have a small garden. I mean, it's fine if that's what you choose. It's fine regardless. Whatever. But um, I wouldn't do this for my size garden, but just to keep, some bagged compost. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Or a nice big bag of worm castings. Mm-hmm. You know, the garden soil will love that. So, and you know, too, at the beginning of the season, like, I mean, I've heard people say, like, oh, well, I put compost in the garden, you know, last spring. Right. You know, well, I mean, go ahead and, and add some again because, you know, it, the, it gets used up. Right. The plants took it all up. There's nothing left. Yeah. It, it, it takes it all up. The organic matter breaks down and decomposes. Mm-hmm. And at some point, it's going to be all gone. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, mm-hmm. my rule of thumb is at the beginning of every growing season, I'm right. adding compost to all of my beds. Which for us is twice a year. Right, twice a year. Right. Yep. Right. In the spring and then in the fall whenever I'm prepping for winter. I agree. Um, if you're not seeing results with your compost, you can have compost that is nutrient deficient, right? Yeah, well, and I mean, yeah, if you look at the studies on the nutrient content of compost, it's actually very low. Mm-hmm. Like the nitrogen will usually be like at 1 or 1. 1.5, right. and then your potassium and your... Um, phosphorus are going to be at like 0.5 to 1. Right. That's not much. No. I mean, if you consider like, you know, traditional fertilizer fertilizers are like 10, 10, 10. Right. Like that's a huge <laughs> difference. Right. Um, huge difference. So, I mean, there's a lot of plants that, yeah, compost is great. Compost is fine. But, you know, you're going to run across some plants that are just heavier feeders mm-hmm. that are going to need more, more than months. just compost. <laughs> right. So keep that in mind and figure out what it is that you want to use as more, whether it's an organic or an inorganic or a traditional or an, an unconventional like um, chicken blood or, you know what I mean? Right. Like, I mean, whatever floats your boat, mm-hmm. just get your plants and your soil fed. Right. That's, that's the point there. Now there is a downside to overusing, mm-hmm. you know, like a commercial fertilizer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can over salt your soil yeah. for sure and, and kill all the life. <laughs> right. But you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You de- I mean, if you're going to buy a conventional inorganic fertilizer, follow the instructions. Absolutely. Do a test patch even and see how your plants react. Yeah. Instead of just putting it out. Yeah. And I find that fertilizers like that, you don't have to use them as much. Right. But if you're using something like fish emulsion Mm -hmm. or worm castings or blood meal, blood meal, any other type Mm -hmm. of organic fertilizer, those things you just have to add to the garden more. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, the plants go through it faster and they're, they're a much weaker, right. Um, 
density, I guess, right. of, of the nutrient. Yeah. Yeah. So not feeding your soil. Um, that's mm-hmm. another reason why gardens fail. Which brings us to our last topic or our last little subtopic here on the topic. And um, so <laughs> let's say you had a great successful garden, which is a whole other topic. Like what is a successful garden? Is it to get the fruit or is it the journey to get the fruit? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a gardener or do you just want to be a harvester? <laughs> right. And a successful garden is going to be different for everybody. Right. Right. But in this context, let's say you have a bunch of fruit out there. Right. You did it. You grew the tomatoes. Right. Right. You grew the cucumbers. Right. And then you got busy with life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you didn't harvest said tomatoes. Yeah. And then you get a heavy rain and all of your tomatoes split. Right. And then you go out there and there's gnats all in the splits of your tomatoes. And there's no salvaging them. No. <laughs> you can turn them into eggs and bacon. <laughs> right. So you can have a successful garden mm-hmm. and it be essentially ruined in the end if you're not harvesting things on time, which Mm -hmm. I am totally guilty of. Mm -hmm. I'm totally guilty of leaving beans on the plants for too long. I was just thinking beans. And they get get rubbery okra. Like I can't tell you how many pieces of okra Mm -hmm. have become pig food at my farm. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Squash, you can, right. you can overgrow. I mean, there, all the things there's, there's so much wasted food in new gardens yeah. And old gardens. I yeah. mean, we're just as guilty. Yeah. But um, there's so much wasted food by not planning that, hey, I'm going to have a harvest in May of tomatoes and, and it's going to be a big harvest and I'm going to have to do something with them. Right. right. And being prepared to mm-hmm. deal with that. Even if it's just, you know, a, a short term fix, like put them in the freezer. Right. Right. right? <laughs> learn learn how to do that and and understand, like leave the white space in your calendar when you plant those things that oh, I'm going to have to harvest and process. Right, right. right. So even if I do harvest, here's here's where I mess up. I harvest, I bring the basket of food in and set it on the back porch. Yeah. Like where I like to wash my vegetables. Uh-huh. And then it sits there until two days later. Right. And then it gets moldy. Yep. Terrible. It happens. You know, I mean, life gets busy. It mm-hmm. happens. Mm-hmm. I've done it countless times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. You, you know what? I know another reason why gardens might fail. Why? Not enough sun. Right. Or too much sun. <laughs> In Florida, you could have too much sun for <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm actually planting shade into my garden with moringa and roselle. Yeah. So designing so that some of your taller things like your okra and um, fruit trees and that kind of thing can can provide a little shade at certain times of the day so that your garden's not getting a full 12 hours of full sun if mm-hmm. you are planted in a field, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think more than too much sun is not enough sun. Yeah, not mm-hmm. enough sun. Yep, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Most places that, I mean, that's going to be four hours of sunlight is a full sun, four to six, mm-hmm. depending on the plant. Mm-hmm. So... Not planting in the sun is going to bring stunted little tiny plants that try to fruit when they barely have their true leaves. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're cute for trying. <laughs> Don't really give you much though. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. So yeah, we thought it would be um, hopefully helpful to y'all um, mm-hmm. just to hear kind of a little hodgepodge of why gardens fail mm-hmm. often. And, um, you know, hopefully it'll help y'all kind of mitigate some of this. And regardless, like, don't be afraid to fail. Just get out there and put some plants in the ground as best as you know how, Mm -hmm. according to whatever way works for you, and just see how it goes. Because the only fail is saying, I have black thumbs and quitting. That's that's the fail. Yeah, and quitting and not doing it all. Right. You know, if you can fail and you can learn from it, it's not necessarily a failure. No, you're failing forward. Yep. All right, guys, get out there planting. Yes, yes. We'll talk to y'all next week, Mm -hmm. and I have no idea what we're going to talk about. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) All right, until then. Later, y'all. Bye-bye.